All right, so we are talking about the Louisiana Purchase, and Jefferson sent out these men, um, the Corps of Discovery, to go map and catalog what was going on out there. And almost immediately on their heels, when they returned in 1806, you have um, not only the men from the expedition heading back out there, such as John Coulter, and exploring places like Yellowstone. And in fact, when John Coulter came back and wrote about boiling pots of mud, people called it Coulter's Hell. Um, but also sort of pioneers and uh, frontiers people started to push even further and further into that new territory in that already in the early 1800s. So, um, while Thomas Jefferson was a Democratic Republican and pretty much an anti-federalist, he did have John Marshall, who had been appointed to the Supreme Court, um, on the court and was starting to really exert the power of not only the Supreme Court, but also um, the power of and supremacy of the federal government under the Constitution. Um, and in fact, that was the only place that Federalist, only branch of government that Federalist controlled were the Supreme Court. Excuse the interruption. Love when I get interrupted. Um, judges on the Supreme Court and on the federal um, bench, any federal court, are appointed for life. And taking advantage of that, John Marshall really led and guided the Supreme Court as its first chief justice. His most influential opinion that he drafted and decision that he forged was Marbury versus Madison in 1803. The Supreme Court was not explicitly given the power of judicial review, which is the power to decide whether or not acts of Congress or acts from the states are constitutional or not. It was implied, but for some reason, the Founding Fathers did not get around to actually making that explicit as their power in the U.S. Constitution. So it took an actual Supreme Court case to garner that power for the Supreme Court. Jefferson attempted to block some Federalist appointments called the Midnight Judges. Um, this was John Adams at the very end of his career, right before he handed over the reins of the country to Thomas Jefferson appointed a bunch of last minute justices um, and justices to, of the peace. And Thomas Jefferson refused to seat them. And, and so a gentleman by the name of Marbury, who wanted the court to force Thomas Jefferson to give him his appointment, sued James Madison, the Secretary of State. Um, under the Judiciary Act, saying the Judiciary Act of 1787 was unconstitutional and established the power of judicial review for the Supreme Court. So basically, John Marshall comes back and says, you know what, I'm really sorry, Marbury, that you didn't get your appointment. That was really cruddy of the current sitting president to not honor that. But unfortunately, I don't have the power to do that. And therefore, that part of the Judiciary Act is null and void and unconstitutional, thereby granting the Supreme Court the power of judicial review. Jefferson attempts to then go ahead and remove partisan judges through impeachment. That doesn't really work very well for him either and is very unpopular. Justices are meant to be sort of above politics. Foreign policy, what's going on on the high seas? Um, you have a situation in the Mediterranean with some nations who are acting as pirates, and it's how they engaged in foreign policy at the times. And these pirates were known as the Bar Barbary Pirates, and they came from the area of Tunisia in North Africa. Um, and they would raid merchant ships off the coast of North Africa. And previous U.S. presidents had actually bribed those pirates to get them to leave them alone, and that was the foreign policy, just pay the bribe. By the time Thomas Jefferson entered the White House, Congress was shelling out nearly one-fifth of its budget to pay off the Barbary pirates, and the Barbary pirates kept demanding more and more money. So Jefferson decided as an act of foreign policy to refuse to continue to pay, and he also sent the U.S. Navy to defend merchant ships using an executive order, because he was pretty sure he wasn't going to get congressional approval, to engage with these pirate ships and protect U.S. merchant ships. The question then becomes, is he stepping above and beyond with his war-making powers? And we'll see that this is really one of the first times that a president 
expands presidential power and most often they expand their presidential power through the use of the war making powers um, and this is not a new thing uh, and it has actually continued you see Abraham Lincoln do it with suspending the writ of habeas corpus and imprisoning American citizens you see it with um, our Vietnam War with that being an undeclared war etc presidents and Congress always have sort of some tension over this issue of war and who has the war making powers is it Congress with their power to declare war or is it the president who is tasked with being commander-in-chief of the armed services by the Constitution it's a good question that you'll get to explore in this class and in government there were some other challenges to US neutrality uh, the Napoleonic War Britain and France were at war shocker from 1803 to 1814 and during that war the British would raid US ships so during this Napoleonic War, the British kept blockading French ports, and any time a U.S. ship tried to go into a French port, the British would seize the ship and jump on and then grab a bunch of sailors and force them into service in the British Navy. And this was called the policy of impressment. Between 1808 and 1811, 6,000 sailors or more were basically kidnapped by the British government and forced to work on British ships. This was a little bit upsetting to Americans, clearly. Um, and ultimately, in 1807, you have a British warship that fires on a U.S. ship, which is another clear violation of our American neutrality. You had three Americans killed, and four were taken hostage by the British. This further fuels anti-British sentiment, and you have war hawks in Congress who are pushing for war. Jefferson chooses diplomacy and economic pressures rather than declaring war on England at this point, but you can see there's some foreshadowing. We will be going to war with Great Britain once again. This incident with the warship off the coast of Virginia was called the Chesapeake and Leopard Affair. So Jefferson decides to respond to Britain with an embargo, which is a trade barrier. Um, he prohibited American merchant ships from sailing to any foreign port as an attempt to punish the Brits. Um, at that point, the British were the U.S.'s biggest trading partner. So when you ban ships from going to foreign ports, you're basically banning them from going to Great Britain. This actually ended up backfiring and causing a lot of economic turmoil, especially in New England in the shipbuilding industry. Jefferson called for its repeal in 1809 but continued to bar trade with the United Kingdom under the Non-Intercourse Act in 1809. You saw all kinds of pamphlets. Um, at this time period, people were up in arms, really upset. 5,000 American seamen detained aboard British vessels. Yes, those Fs are actually Ss up here. And... Um, the Embargo Act, however, was not very popular, and you can actually see the dramatic decline and impact that it had on exports and the economy here at this time period. So this is actually very problematic, and that is the end of the Jefferson era. Yay! With 8,000 interruptions. Bye!